for the gift of a new day. I thank you for the life that you've given us, and I thank you for enabling us to attend this lesson. Lord, I pray that you continue protecting us and enable mm -hmm. us to understand whatever we are going to learn. Bless the works of our hands and also bless our teacher in just my name of prayed. Amen. Thank you very much, Esther. Uh, dear students, you're most welcome to the lesson today. Um, today, I I'm going to make us look at something new. We will not continue with what we had the last time. I want us to look at viruses. That is something that came up. Some of you were saying you want to study a little bit about viruses. So the one hour we have today, we are going to go over viruses and hope we can do an exercise and see that we have understood what we want. So I'll get straight to business. Let's try and be orderly so that you don't make me turn off many of the controls that I have that could make our lesson more lively. So I'll get straight to business. Today we are going to study about viruses. And as you know, viruses is not a very short topic. We took some time to study about it at school. I hope most of us did study about viruses. So I'll just go over some of the highlights of viruses. If we get time, we should be able also to, um, we should be able to look at one of the types of viruses and study about it. So when we think about viruses, what comes to our minds? I would like for us to share. When we talk about viruses, what do we think of? Yes, Ryan. A virus is a very tiny particle that can only be seen using an electronic microscope. Very good. Thank you very much. Yes, we can only see it when we use an electronic microscope. These other microscopes in the lab don't bother. You will not see the, the, the virus. Joshua. Joshua, you can unmute. Yeah, a virus is a very tiny pathogen that can only be seen using an electron microscope, and it is composed of a core having a, nucle a nuclear acid enclosed by a caspid, which is then covered by a protein coat. coat. Protein coat. Thank you very much. Hey, you're good at reading. There are some terms you have used there. I don't know if everyone has understood it them if they haven't they should ask but i had pathogen capsid and so on there is someone labeled samsung so thank you joshua thank you for that submission someone labeled samsung i don't want to pick because i wanted to pick to people Jaden. okay a virus is an effective agent that typically consists of a nucleic acid we seem to be losing you, Jaden. How sad. But I'll say yes, you are very correct. I had some to say. It is an effective agent. Did you get so me? Pathogen, pathogen, infective agent, those things, they are coming up. Esther Agatha. Um, a virus is an effective agent that typically consists of a nucleic acid in a protein coat. <clears throat> okay, so we seem to know what a virus is. Samsung um, SM, you don't seem to know how to rename or what? Could you lower your, okay, could you, let me just give you the last chance to check, talk. You can talk to us, Samsung. I think that a virus is a, an infectious agent 
a submicroscopic agent. If I mean, sorry, a virus is a submicroscopic infectious agent that that can only survive in a host cell. Mm -hmm. So we seem to know everything about viruses, and you're using big words. I know your teachers should have helped you to understand them. Submicroscopic. So for it, it you can't even see it under ordinary microscopes. And say someone said you use the electron microscope. The electron microscope magnifies things so many more times than that microscope which you use at home. So for many at school. So for it, it is better and it's very expensive. Okay. Um with oh Eduku, let me first listen to you before I start sharing what I have. Yes, Eduku. Daniel. Okay, Daniel is having issues, maybe networks. Okay, so let's share what I have prepared. Seems like we know a lot, so we're just jogging our memories. If I mention something that you don't agree with or you're not comfortable with, please do not hesitate to raise your hand so that we work on it, okay? And then we will move together. So as many of you can say, I mean, since I'm the talker, we shall just raise hands. Otherwise, when people are landing in, they are disorganizing us. There are some. A virus is a submicroscopic infectious agent that replicates itself into the cells of a living organism. Oh, finally, Daniel, you talked. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. I did not hear any one of you tell me that viruses are not living things. Although someone alluded to why they are not living things. Jojo, please try to behave. I know you have used Zoom before and so you can, you know how to annotate. Everyone who is here by the way knows how to annotate. They are just disciplined and are not annotating. So viruses, they are not living things, but they exist in nature. They make us sick. In Uganda recently, you noticed schools were closed for nearly two years because of a virus. But that virus is not a true living thing. And we are going to see why biologists think they are not true living things. For example, as people have said, it is a small biological particle. We said it is so small, you cannot see it with an ordinary microscope. You need special big microscopes called electron microscopes. I don't know if in Uganda we have many, but I have only known of one electron microscope. It's in Makere University in Mulago, the medical school. I don't know if it's still working. But they are big, they are expensive, and those are the ones under which you can see microscopes. Sorry, under which you can see viruses. This virus is like a particle we are going to see. It can be made into crystals. But this particle can infect cells. That's why many of you are saying it is an infectious particle. And when it enters cells, it starts reproducing inside them. Those cells which it enters are what we call host cells. I had someone talking about a virus reproducing inside the host cell. So the host cell is that cell which is keeping the virus. As I have said, viruses can infect and cause deadly diseases to humans, plants, and other organisms. Some of the viruses we have heard about are AIDS. Sorry, this should be HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. So the disease called AIDS is caused by a virus. The disease called hepatitis B is called by a, caused by a virus. Ebola is caused by a virus. COVID, 
the COVID-19, the coronavirus disease is caused by a virus and even cassava mosaic. This one affects our plants. It is also caused by a virus. So some of you showed me that you knew even what a virus looks like. So we can just remind ourselves a virus is a small parasite that cannot reproduce by itself. Once it infects the cell, however, a virus can cause the cell to produce more viruses. Can you imagine? The cell stops producing other things which it is supposed to make, and it starts making virus after virus. Eventually, there are so many viruses in your body, and yet we say they are so tiny, meaning you can fit very many of them in a small spaces in a small space. Now, yes, Sise, I see your hand is up. I'll let you talk. Mm, but Sise, you don't have a microscope. Sorry, I, you don't have a microphone, so I don't know if I can help you. Please get out of the class and re-enter, but when you're entering, tap that you're going to use cellular network so that you can hear. I think your problem is you can't hear. Okay, I'll proceed. Now, most viruses, what makes them to be able to reproduce? They have these special acids. These acids are the ones which make up what we call genetic material. And in, when you studied cells, you studied about genetic material in which cell organelle is the genetic material found. You can raise your hand so that I unmute you. In which cell organelle do we find the genetic material? Anyone who remembers? Hey, my daughter's and son. Okay, I have. Yes, a twin. I think DNA. DNA is a. Uh, part of the genetic material, but in which part of the cell is DNA found? That's my question. Yes, Nicholas. The nucleus. It is found in the nucleus. Okay, so it's found in the nucleus. That is very, very true. Now, DNA that nuclear material which is found in the nucleus. For most organisms, it is usually DNA. Even as it is DNA, but some viruses have DNA while others have RNA. Both of them can do something similar, but the one which does it easily is DNA. And that thing is called, in your biology, your teacher must have told you, what is DNA in full? You can tell me what DNA is in full or RNA in full. Yes, uh, Sisi, now you have a microphone. Yes. So my screen is not clear. I'm really sorry. I don't know if everyone's screen is not clear, but don't worry, I am saying the words so you can listen to the words I'm saying. Then afterwards, you'll get the notes, okay? Okay. Hmm. Patricia, your hand is up. Are you going to tell us what DNA means in full? Yes, Patricia. Okay, Patricia seems to be having issues. Felista? Teacher DNA in full is teacher pardon DNA in full is deoxyribonucleic acid. Very good, thank you very much. So that is the chemical. You see, I said it is an acid. The last part of its name shows you acid. Who now knows what RNA is in full? Xerex. It is ribonucleic acid. 
Very good. It is right. For me, I call it rye, ribonucleic acid. DNA is deoxy ribonucleic acid. But the pronunciation is not a problem as long as you can spell it. So viruses have those things. Some of them have DNA and some of them have a RNA. And that is what enables them to produce more viruses when they enter the host cell. Veronica, please just tilt your phone so that you can see better. Now, that thing called a virus, the entire thing which can infect is the part of the virus which can infect is what you call the virion. And as, I, as people said, it is made up of nucleic acid. And then also there is an outer shell. Someone called it a capsid. That is true. Your notes are clear. I have here a picture to show you the simplest way I can show you how a virus looks. You see this string here inside? It represents the nucleic acid. The nucleic acid can be DNA or RNA. Then that nucleic acid is in a space. That space, someone said it is the core. That was very correct. Then surrounding the core, that is where we have the protein coat, which people have referred to as a capsid. I know at school you're allowed to research and get this knowledge. So we know it, we are just revising. Some viruses have an envelope outside the core. So that is the basic structure of a virus, but the shapes of the virus has changed, especially the shape of this, uh, of the protein coat. The protein coat of the coronavirus, you see how it looks like fireworks, for others it looks like a ball and so on. Now, what are the characteristics of these viruses? Again, many of you shared them, they reproduce inside cells, they are very, very small. All of you kept saying they can be seen with the electron microscope. Actually, viruses are smaller than bacteria. And yet we all think bacteria are small. But viruses are so much smaller than bacteria that there are some viruses which have been discovered which infect bacteria. They enter the bacteria and cause the bacteria to start making viruses and the vi bacteria bursts. So the smallest thing which can ever show life is a virus. Then their particle, we have said, consists of either DNA or RNA. They do not have any, they don't look like cells. You remember in um, senior, when the very first topic your teachers told you was about cells. Do you recall some of the parts of a cell? Let us share parts of a cell because we are revising. Yes, faith or? Faith. Nucleus. Mm -hmm. The cell should have a nucleus. That is beautiful. A twinning. Yes. Cell wall. Hmm, do all cells have cell walls, Anna? Let us think about it. It's only a few cells which have cell walls. Those are the plant cells. But otherwise, not all cells have cell walls. Brandon, please behave. I was telling here, everyone here knows how to annotate. So please don't show us that you can annotate. Yes, Patricia. Have the cytoplasm. They have a cytoplasm. Very good. Then, but I'm having the same. Oh, their hands down here, which I hadn't seen. I want more people to participate. Martha K. Cytoplasm. Cytoplasm. Thank you. But someone mentioned it. Let's pay attention so that we don't repeat what others have said. Uh -huh. 
Vambragatash. I hope that's that pronunciation. Cell membrane. Yes, cell membrane is what someone mixed up as cell wall. So those are some of the things which a cell has. A virus does not have them. A virus does not have a nucleus. A virus does not have a cell membrane. It doesn't have a cytoplasm. It doesn't have even those things you say, buchloroplast or mitochondria. Mm -mm. A virus does not have those things. So that's why we say it does not have a cell structure and organelles. The chloroplast mitochondria are all organelles. So for it, what can it do? Viruses can be made into crystals. In fact, when you hear countries fighting, there's, I think it was the States, I don't remember, some time back, where people would pack the crystallized viruses, deadly virus, then they pack it in an envelope like a letter. You receive the letter. Remember, the virus is very, 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 very tiny. You open the letter to try and read, you just fall sick. Because the moment you open the envelope like this and open the paper, the viruses come to you. And then they will start entering your cells and infect you. So viruses can be made into crystals. When they're outside, they're host cells. Now, so why, if they can be made into crystals, really, we have crystals like sugar and salt, and those are not living things. But again, they are telling us viruses are living things. So they are, the reason they say that is because viruses show some characteristics of living things. Oh, first, let us look at why they are said to be non-living. It's because they can survive outside the host cell. You cannot find a virus reproducing or feeding or moving or growing those characteristics or excreting like other living things do when it is not in a host cell. So that is why some scientists are saying people don't like us. Viruses are not living things. Then they cannot carry out those things we call metabolism, the chemical reactions. As I've said, they can't respire, they can't excrete, they can't do anything on their own. But when they enter the host, things start happening. They only reproduce when inside the host cell, that when I have said, then we have said they don't have things of cells. You see, there is a group of scientists which believe that everything which has life must have cells. Chokada virus does not have cells. So it's very confusing. So those people are saying, since it doesn't have cells, uh -uh, it's not a living thing. Now, why are others saying, you people, viruses are living things? They are saying that because the viruses can reproduce when they enter a host cell. Other things cannot. If you go to your sugar and put it inside a cell, it will never reproduce. Water cannot reproduce, but a virus can reproduce when it enters another host cell. So some scientists are saying, Banangi, let us be serious. A virus is a living thing. Then when it gets inside the host cell, it can carry out metabolism. Really, something which can do that is a living thing. Okay, Ariana, your hand is up. You have something to ask? Oh, the hand went down. Okay, I'll proceed. So those are the reasons. Now, some of you usually mistake bacteria for viruses and viruses for bacteria. So can we share some of the differences between the two? Who knows differences between bacteria and viruses? Yes, Nicholas. Tell us how we can tell them apart. Viruses are smaller in size compared to bacteria. Beautiful. So the smallest is the virus. Okay. Uh, Faith. Yes, Faith. Faith went. Yes, Faith. Um, I think bacteria are 
have indefinite shape, while viruses have a definite shape. Mm -hmm. Now that one is not very true, my dear. You cross check your notes, what you put. If you put it down, you edit it. The, bac okay. the ba bacteria have a definite shape. A definite is something which is fixed and does not change. Eh? They have a definite shape. So that difference we shall not uh, take. Remember, we are revising to make our work better. Felista? Teacher, I think bacteria exist in all types of environment while viruses become crystallized when left outside the host. <laughs> but they be existing there. It's true. Bacteria exist in all environments, but we cannot say that viruses are absent there. So again, that one is not a very good one. Can we talk about their structure? Someone has already talked about their size. So can we talk something about their structure? What they have or what they don't have? Swaibu. Could you be louder? Get nearer to your microphone. I'm not going to talk about the structure. Mm. But I know that there are difference. But bacteria have been using cells that. Please, Swipe, can you draw nearer to your microphone? Um, a bacteria mm. is a big living cell that can live inside or outside the body. While a virus can move. Okay, I don't know who had him well, but I think he was talking about where they can live, that the bacteria can live, live outside or inside the house, can show life characteristics, something like that. That's what I had. Thank you for your submission, Swaibu. I still have her KJ styles. Ex Madam, I think that uh, vir viruses uh, only live in uh, the horse's body. They survive on, on the horse's body. They can't survive on their own. Well, bacteria can survive on their own. Mm -hmm. That is what we're saying. They be there when they are crystals, just that they don't show the characteristics of living things. People, you have nothing to say about the structure. I want someone who is talking about the structure now. Oh, the hands have gone down. Maggie? Yes, Maggie. Okay, teacher. Mm. Uh, I'm talking by binary fusion while viruses reproduce. By replication. Mm -hmm. That one seems to make sense. Okay. Now we are going in the right direction. Vambra uh, Gatash. Eh, she has disappeared. Rukia. Rukia, I've asked you to unmute. Okay, okay, I might be having issues with the network. Atwine. Unmuting. Okay, Rukia, yes, you can talk. Eh, she has gone off. Let me give you a second. Oh, Atwine, yes. According to the structure, <sighs> bacteria are organisms comprised of a single cell, while viruses, they are not cells. Okay, that's beautiful. Viruses are not made of cells, while bacteria are made of a single cell. Beautiful, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Chelimo, I'll take the last three, Rukia, Joshua, and Chelimo. Mm -hmm. So the viruses, viruses lack a true cellular structure, while bacteria, they have true cellular structure. Beautiful. Now you're talking of structures, yeah, huh? Uh, Joshua? Uh, I think uh, 
uh, viruses have an envelope where bacteria is a cell membrane. Mm -hmm. You're trying to get what covers, eh? Okay. Yeah, that can be the bacteria have cell membranes, the others don't have them. Those are beautiful answers. The last one, let me give uh, Rukia uh, the last chance. Yes, Rukia. Okay, Rukia has failed. Let us move on and see what are some of the differences that exist so that we don't continue to mistake these two. For example, that is what a virus looks like and that is what a bacteria looks like. I think you can see some very clear differences. Hmm? You can see one of them has a cytoplasm, the other one doesn't have. People have talked about one having a cell membrane, the other one doesn't have. One has a cell wall, the other one doesn't have it. Uh, one has nuclear material. But now the virus, instead of having nuclear material, it just has either DNA or RNA. Then some bacteria have flagella. These things, when they are many, they are called flagella. These belong things, they are from enabling the bacterium to swim. But when it is one, it is a flagellum. So the differences, as you've said them, are there. If there is any that you had not captured in your notes, you can put it. But the first one we are saying bacteria are living things. Viruses are usually not living. The second one, someone gave it to us very well that the viruses are smaller than the bacteria. Viruses are not made of cells. So that one someone has said, hey, thank you very much. Something which is not made of cells, we say it is a cellular. It is a cellular. Then something which is made of cells. Now the bacteria are made of cells, but I think we mentioned the cells are prokaryotic. They do not have a true, nu a true nucleus. Mm -hmm. Viruses, when it comes to DNA, they do not contain DNA, but sorry, the bacteria contain both DNA and RNA, but the viruses contain only one. Either, you see that word either. It means they have one of them, but not both. Then the other differences we are saying, most bacteria cause no harm. Some are even useful to us, but viruses, the only thing we know about viruses is they cause diseases to us. Can you imagine? Yet we have some bacteria which are good. They can be used to make yogurt tea, to make cheese. Um, they, they fix nitrogen, nitrogen fixing bacteria. Some bacteria are good. Some of them even are harmless. They be there in our bodies, but a virus. Oh, for it, it is always bad news. So since some bacteria cause diseases, when we are treating them, we treat those diseases using chemicals called antibiotics. But when the, the diseases which, cause, which are caused by viruses, we treat them using uh, drugs called antiviral drugs. Okay, so that is what we can say. I saw a hand up. Ariana, ask your question before we go to something else. Yes, Ariana. Excuse me, teacher. I can't really get anything. You can't see anything or you can't hear anything. Yes, Ariana. Uh, yes, because of network, some of us cannot see what is being shared. But I know you have this in your notebooks. Just turn your notebook to that page. Then if I make a difference that you do not have, maybe you could mention and you look at it, okay? Otherwise, don't be stressed because all of us studied these things at school. We are just revising to make sure we have understood them well. Yes, Joseph. Yes, 
Joseph? Teacher, like on the screen, it's kind of what is something blocking over, kind of making some summary. Yes, and I'm saying it could be a network issue, which I cannot do much change on. You get me, my dear? That's why I'm saying when I mention something, please record it if you check what you have. If you don't have it, you can ask for it to be repeated. Because the funny thing with network, you find one person is in a good place and they can see well, another one is in a bad place and they can't see well. So that makes our life hard and we can't change it much, okay? There isn't much I can do about it, but you could adjust also where you're seated so that maybe it becomes better, okay? So that is what we can say the differences between viruses and bacteria. The important thing, even you whose screen is not showing well, can you go and list down ways in which the bacteria differ from viruses. So that the next time you go to hospital and the doctor tells you, you are suffering from a viral infection. You have an idea of what that doctor is talking about. Or they tell you, ah, these are bacteria disturbing you. You have an idea. Sometimes someone can give you even the wrong medicine. You can be alert and you know, mm, you've given me antiviral to treat. Bacteria, bacteria are treated with antibiotics. So you can help that person and you get better, which will help you. So as I said, most of us covered, we covered this work in school, but we are revising. Please go back and revisit your notes. I wanted so much for us to talk about one virus before the lesson ends. And that is a virus which attacks cassava plants, the cassava mosaic virus. This virus, like I said, we said viruses for them, the only thing we know about them is that they cause diseases to us. We have not yet known viruses to do any other thing except to cause diseases. But the good thing is that Viruses are specific. The virus which attacks cassava cannot attack human beings. The one which attacks human beings cannot attack monkeys. The one which attacks, eh? So they are specific. So today I want us to talk very briefly about a virus called the cassava mosaic virus. It is a virus which can attacks our cassava. And in Uganda, we enjoy eating cassava a lot. So, what does it do to that cassava? We are going to see. It is spread uh, when, when we are planting the cassava. You can get infected cassava cuttings and put them in the garden. Then when they grow, you find all your cassava plants sick. If not, there are certain insects called white flies. Those insects can carry the virus, and they infect us of the disease. Yes, Esther, your hand is up. Okay, teacher, this is just a concern. Um, I think around a minute ago, you just said a virus which affects cassava cannot affect um, humans. A virus which affects monkeys cannot affect humans. So mm -hmm. they were saying that maybe Ebola virus came from maybe monkeys and it kills them. So that was just a rumor. Ebola can't affect both humans and monkeys or maybe I've misunderstood. It was uh, killing the monkeys, but the monkeys were vectors. You get it? Eh? So human beings who kill monkeys for food would go kill the monkey. The monkey was fine and running about, but not suffering from the disease. You get it? So yeah. For you, you get that disease. But for us, when it enters our bodies, it makes us sick and we die. You get it. I hope that clarifies on that issue. Okay, then Vam Bragatash. You have names. Okay, Vam Bragatash has lowered the hand. So that is so the cassava mosaic 
virus affects cassava plants, but it is transmitted by certain flies called white flies. It can be with them without making them sick, but when it gets on the cassava plants, it makes them sick. Okay, so that is that on transmission. We take it using cuttings, which are got from infected plants, or it is transmitted by the white flies. I said, those who cannot see, please, at least you can hear. Let us utilize that. Otherwise, we will just have trouble for nothing. So this is a picture of the white fly. Those flies, if you find these flies on your cassava, they're usually on the lower side of the cassava plants. I think of the cassava leaves. I think they'd be trying to dodge the sunlight. When you find them, you just know those things are deadly. They spread the virus for cassava mosaic. And this is a picture of the underside of a cassava leaf with very many of these um, white flies there. And eventually, if they leave the virus there, they will cause the disease of cassava mosaic to the plant. You will write more on the disease, but I think now, unfortunately, some of the problems it can cause is that the crop is, um, inf is stunted. The leaves become yellow and poorly developed with small spots. And most of all, remember in cassava, we are interested in eating tubers, which are big. When the cassava tubers are infected with cassava, when the cassava leaves are infected with cassava mosaic, you find that the the yield that tubers which you get out are very small. So some people don't mind. They say, mm -hmm. Pastor, it is the leaves which are affected. Me, I'm waiting for my roots. Mama, the leaves are supposed to make the food for, which is going to be transported down and stored in the root tubers. So if the leaves are sick, they will make little or no food. So you keep your cassava in the ground for a year. And then you get out and get it. it has very small tubers. So that is why this disease bothers the farmers. So the yield of the crop becomes very reduced. I think if you've seen cassava plants with such leaves, eh? as if the leaves are wrinkled, but not very wrinkled, you know it is suffering from cassava mosaic disease. This one here is an image of healthy cassava leaves. You can see the difference between healthy cassava leaves and the leaves of a cassava plant, which is infected with cassava mosaic disease. So I will, Patricia, you have your hand up. Yes, Patricia. Okay, teacher. In, in my note, I, I had place a, a symptom, okay, a sign as black spots on the leaves and the stems. So is it okay to say that? Mm, I haven't seen them, but if that is what you have seen, did you visit any cassava garden or have you visited any cassava garden since you studied about the cassava mosaic disease? Please take time to visit and then you write what you are seeing, okay? Many of you are at home, you're not doing much, and you have cassava gardens near you. Please ask your neighbors. You can go there and you see their cassava. If you see it has such a thing, then you check it and say, we are going to listen to a video where some farmers are talking about their problems. Van Bragatash, you're the last one to ask, and then um, we watch the video before I send you off to read more on cassava mosaic, yes? Madam, me, I'm asking when you mm. eat those that cassava with what, yeah? with cassava, which is infected with cassava mosaic, does it cause any disadvantage to you or something? No, it does not. Remember what we eat are the roots, and the roots contain food which has been stored by the cassava plant. So, for you, eating uh, cassava. 
from a cassava plant that was infected with cassava mosaic has no problem. It will not make you sick. But the problem is you'll not get enough cassava. Can you imagine keeping your cassava in the ground for a year and then it comes out very thin, almost like a pen or a little bigger? That will leave you very hungry, the whole village. If it affected the whole village, people will be sick and they will not get enough food to eat. When we plant our cassava, we expect to get bigger tubers, which we can eat and even sell to the neighbors. Edoku, I said everyone here knows how to annotate. Please do not make me think that you're interacting with Zoom for the first time. Okay, so let we have little time left. I hope you'll manage to see this video. Those who can, please do. And then we share what you have learned. Okay. So we listen attentively to what is in the video. And then we will share what has we have heard for those who will have heard or seen. Read, I want to cross check if the volume was there. I'm sorry. Sometimes I share and don't share. Oh, it was there. So, those who have good network, you should be able to follow. Those who don't have, please bear with us. Your friends are going to tell you what they'll have watched. In Africa, cassava is one of the people's main foods. Selling cassava allows farmers and processors to make a lot of money. But when cassava is sick, it does not produce very much and the farmer's benefit dwindles. <laughs> This crop was planted three months before the other one, but it's smaller. Even if it stays one more year in the soil, it will not grow any bigger. A disease is preventing the crop from growing big tubes. And if cassava is not any bigger, it no longer makes money for us and we lose what we invested. So we must control and fully destroy the disease. A healthy cassava crop has leaves which are completely green. But on our fields we often see spots on cassava leaves which are light green or yellow. At times, some of the leaves become deformed and small. This shows that the crop is suffering from the virus disease of cassava, also called cassava mosaic virus disease. The sick plant does not produce a lot of cassava. The cassava mosaic virus disease is an important disease which causes low yields. It can be recognized on the cassava leaves, which have spots ranging from light green to yellow. The disease is given to the plant by the white fly. The disease cannot be cured, but it can be avoided. To prevent the cassava mosaic virus disease, we must use cuttings which have not been attacked by the disease. Most of all, we must plant varieties which are resistant to the disease. 
if we observe these good practices, we will avoid the cassava mosaic virus disease and our plants will grow a lot of cassava. In this way, we will have more benefits. <laughs> okay. I hope some people managed to see something. Anyone who watched something or picked something? Yes, Atwine. Over to you, Atwine. I learned ways to prevent the cassava, cassava mosaic. Which are some of those ways you learned? Using cuttings not attacked by the disease and using variants which are resistant to the disease. Thank you very much. You learned something from the video. Uh, or something like that. Angel. Yes. What did you learn? To me, I learned that cassava mosaic is spread by a white fly and it cannot be chewed, but it can be, it can be prevented or avoided. And we should mm -hmm. also plant mm -hmm. cuttings that are free from the disease so as to have good yields and high yields. Very beautiful. At least some people picked something. Uh, Bridget? Um, I learned that when this virus attacks cassava plants, their leaves become deformed and small. And they say that is dangerous. Sisi? I've learned that when a cassava is affected by cassava mosaic virus, it is it ranges between light green and yellow. Oh, what link? Those ranges are the spots. If you looked at the image, I don't know if you could see the picture. The spots are the ones which range in that. Okay. Um, there are some days I said I don't talk to phones. You'll forgive me, Jaden. Okay. Even though it spends one year in the soil, it will never like grow cassava. The cassava will not come out. Yeah. It will not be big. The roots will be there, but they are not big. James. Oh, sorry. I've learned, I've learned mm -hmm. that uh, the, le the leaves of the cassava plant come wrinkled. Yes, so I hope you people can go and recognize sick cassava plants in your village. And maybe if the person who is growing that cassava is your friend or someone you can talk to, you can advise them on how to avoid the cassava mosaic disease. People, our time is fast running. I'm sorry, I have to move to another class, but I'm sending you off to go and revise more on the cassava mosaic disease. Okay. I think the slides for today, we are done. Oh, the prevention we had talked about, use of healthy planting materials. You make sure the stems you cut you get them from gardens where all the cassava plants are fine. You look at the leaves, if they are fine, then you plant, you use those stem cuttings. Then if you find you have some, if you saw in the video, those people were pulling out some cassava plants. Once you notice you have some sick plants, please go ahead, uproot them and burn them. Because if they stay there, the white flies will come and get the virus from them and take to your healthy plant. And then eventually they form, they all get, get sick. Then this one, many of you had it, that we should plant resistant varieties. Also plant disease-free cuttings. 
make sure that cuttings do not have the disease. But if you are, if you notice early and before your plants are fully infected, you can apply chemicals to kill the white flies so that they do not spread the disease. So those are some of the ways we can stop the spread of the cassava mosaic in our gardens. I want to send you out to do more reading on the cassava mosaic. Next lesson, we shall look at another virus, okay? And then we get to understand these viruses very well because I know we all study those viruses. I didn't want to take hands because it is time, but let me see if there's anyone who hasn't spoken whose hand is up, but you've all spoken. Um, Anneli is okay, you can ask one question and then we go. Excuse me, madam, I never understood the thing. Do also bacteria, can they, okay, do they also survive in the host's body, bacteria? Yes, bacteria keep enter our, no, the difference which, which I should mention, viruses even outside, they can be there as crystals and they survive. That is why they, for, we will study either Ebola or coronavirus in the next lesson. That is why they tell you disinfect, put their chemicals so that you kill the virus. Otherwise, the virus can stay there alive. It's not inside the cell. The important thing to know about the virus is that it will show that it is a living thing only when it enters the host cell. That is when it starts doing the characteristics of living things like reproducing. So that is what we keep talking about the host cell. For a bacteria, even outside a living thing, it can reproduce, outside another cell, it can reproduce, it can excrete, it can grow. But a virus can only do the reproduction and respiration, whatever it has to do. It can only do it when it is inside a host cell. I hope that answers your question. Okay, Martha K. Yes, Martha. I just wanted to give the closing prayer. Oh, thank you very much, Martha. Could you pray for us? And we go because it's time really. Humble yourselves and we pray. Heavenly Father, King of Glory, we thank you for today. We thank you for the gift of life, for the gift of wisdom knowledge and understanding. And as we are leaving this meeting, Father King of Glory, we pray that may you continue being with us. May you always be with us and provide to us, Father King of Glory. We put our teacher into your hands, Father King of Glory. May you protect her, may you provide them to her, Father King of Glory. And above all, may you will be done through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for attending. We meet next week.